Insecurities are a difficult thing to get through in life. We accumulate them over the years, and many times the older we get, the more we can wrestle with them. Most of the time we have negative past experiences, and we can tend to live out our lives through these insecurities. And sometimes we have insecurities, but we hide them and try to act prideful and stronger than we actually are, which is a terrible way to live. But there is good news though. We can overcome insecurity by discovering our identity and doing certain actions to help us not live by our past experiences. So let me introduce to you 10 principles on how to overcome insecurity. Principle number one, be real and fellowship. First John chapter one, verse seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In this passage, John is encouraging us to walk in the light, which is the truth of God. And by doing this, we then will have fellowship with each other. You see, when we walk in light and are truthful to one another and real, it sets the foundation for godly relationships and allows for us to truly connect to other believers. And I should note, having fellowship with other believers will help you grow. So for you, some things that could help you is to try to get involved in a home Bible study, small group, youth group, or even a weekly gathering where you have the context to be honest and real and open up. And by doing this, you can better discover what God thinks about you and your life, and you'll be able to do life with others and not alone. For my friend, when he was 20 years old, he would go to a local coffee shop with his Christian friends. And there they'd ask questions about God together and also read their Bibles. And he argues that this time in his life was probably the greatest time of growth, and it's there that he learns to become more secure in God. Principle number two, stand up for your faith. Romans chapter one, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In this passage, Paul commands the Roman church to be bold and to make a stand for the gospel. And then he says that God is revealed by faith and that God's righteous people should live by faith. And what I want you to pay attention to is Paul's call for believers not to be ashamed of their faith. So our faith should be something that we as Christians should be secure in. You see, if we're too afraid to take a stand on an issue, especially when it comes to Jesus, we will never discover the boldness and confidence God wants to give us. You see, God calls us to take a stand, and that means we should look at our faith and stand in it with the grace, love, and kindness that Jesus had. I mean, yeah, we as a church can concentrate on Jesus being loving, but he was also incredibly bold and was never ashamed. So for you, should you find yourself in a place where you could possibly take a stand for Jesus, breathe, and then ask God for boldness, and see if you can bring God into your situation. And remember, when making a stand for your faith, speak in truth, and at the same time, speak in love and humility. Hey guys, Joe here, taking a quick time out to let you know that for the first time ever, our channel now has merch available to purchase. We got stickers, we got shirts, we got sweaters, we got mugs, we got all sorts of cool things. And we're really excited to bring this to you. It's been a long time coming. Miles and I are very, very excited. For those of you who are members on our YouTube channel, you should have seen a post recently that gives you 15% off in a discount code for any merchandise that you purchase. So if you go to the link in the description, that'll take you to TeePublic, punch in that discount code, it'll get you 15% off. For everyone else, link is in the description and it's also tagged on our YouTube store. We'd encourage you to check it out. We're gonna be trying to drop a new design about every quarter or so, so every three months thereabouts. Um, so keep checking back for new designs, new merch, all sorts of fun things. We'll be letting you know as it gets dropped. So appreciate you guys. Let's get back to the video. Principle number three, act on what God is telling you. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. In this passage, Saul disobeyed God and he didn't act on what God was specifically instructing because he feared what the people would think. Previously, God told him to not keep any of the livestock after he overtook the Amalekites. But Saul only obeyed God in part because of his insecurity about what people might think. So note, if we have any fear of doing what God tells us to do and only do what we think is necessary, 
we are not living our life by a secure path. Because when we walk in total obedience and follow God's commands for our life, it is then that we can have complete security, where no matter the outcome or the circumstance, God controls it. So if God instructs us specifically on something we need to do, we as God's people cannot partly obey because it will never result in complete security. And to add to that, we shouldn't seek the approval of others over God because at the end of the day, they don't understand the full picture. So for you, one way to seek God's approval over others is to obey the simple instructions in the Bible. Look at Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? In this verse, God is telling his people to do what is right, to act out of kindness, and to walk with him in humility. So for you, if you're ever wondering what God wants you to do, this passage will help you follow simple instructions that God gives you. And I will say that your sense of security will be better established as you walk in the simple truths commanded here. Principle number four, give to others out of love. First John chapter three, verse 16, by this we know love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. In this passage, it says we know what love is by Jesus laying his life down for us. And then John commands believers to love one another in the same way Jesus loved us. So for us, if someone is in need and we close our heart to them, we aren't loving the way God calls us to. You see, we can't just talk about doing good things and loving people. We actually have to show love. And when we give to others, there is a level of sacrifice that happens. And that's how Jesus gave love, sacrificially. You see, when we give sacrificially and don't expect anything in return, it creates relationship and love and trust, and it makes us humble ourselves before God. So if by chance we are fearful with our possessions, we embrace financial insecurity. But when we choose to give and make it a point to stop comparing our statuses and our stuff, we can finally move in a deeper place of trust with others. Look at Acts chapter four, verses 32 to 33. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. In the book of Acts, the early church at this time shared all of their possessions. And I want you to notice that because of their unified heart, they moved with great power and great grace and they allowed the Holy Spirit to have complete authority over how they gave and what they gave. So getting to the point, when we give sacrificially, it creates a deep sense of unity and community with those that we are blessing. And by doing this, we are taking steps to love in the same way that Jesus loved. So if at any point we become selfish with our belongings, we need to ask God to open our heart and to respond in generosity. Because generosity, is outward focused and insecurity is self-focused. So for you, find someone you can bless and connect with them. And don't just give and then not connect, give to someone so you can connect and love like Jesus. A few ways you can do this is by giving a physical gift, giving financially to a cause you wanna be a part of, or even give yourself emotionally by listening. And a great way to show love to someone by giving is to give someone your time. And I'd add to that, if you do spend time with someone, put away your phone and try to give them your undivided attention. Principle number five, serve others and stretch your ability. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 35. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. In this passage, King Solomon is emphasizing the point of blessing others. And he tells his audience that as they do this, they will be watered or refreshed. A close friend of mine has taken many teams to foreign countries on mission trips. And one of the things they make it a point to do is to go to places less fortunate and to make attempts to bless them. And my friend was telling me that something interesting always happens. And as my friend and his mission team tried to bless the people they're staying with, the natives there blessed the team more. And they would go out of their way to treat them. One time the mission team was serving in a slum in Brazil that was filled with poor families that didn't have much clothing. 
and the team helped sort decorations and helped them clean their homes, and they all ate lunch together. But despite the fact that it was hot and miserable outside, everyone was bonding, having fun, and enjoying their time together. And later that evening, after dinner, the people who lived in the slum all said thank you by singing a song to my friend's mission team. And when the team had to leave and say goodbye, everyone was in tears because everyone knew that they probably wouldn't see each other again. And what my friend found to be incredible is the fact that despite this trip being only one day long, through acts of service, everyone bonded in an incredible way. And there was a deep sense of unity that he's never felt before. And one of his team members said, I now know what heaven will feel like because of the love that I saw today. So all that to say, when we stretch ourselves and serve and do things that we don't normally do, we become watered and blessed in a very deep way. And it's this deep sense of community that can give us confidence and comfort. And to add to that, serving others can produce close relationships that can last a lifetime, and both sides can discover new things about themselves. So something I'd encourage you to do is to possibly join a team that wants to do a serving project, or try something completely new with only one purpose, being a servant. And if for some reason you feel like you can't help with anything, don't second guess your ability. God may surprise you. And he has a history of empowering people who have a heart to help. Because sometimes all you really need is a good attitude and a genuine willingness to serve. And should you serve, be like Jesus and work with your hands and with your heart. Principle number six, be okay with being weak. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In this passage, it's showing us that God's power is made perfect in weakness. So what I want you to notice here is that our weakness displays God's power, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. And we, like Paul here, can be content in that. Because when we are weak, we are strong because of God's strength. So it's okay to be weak, and it's okay to make mistakes. And I'd argue that there can be no real success without making mistakes. Think of a baby learning to walk. A good parent wouldn't be angry when the baby falls down. A normal parent would probably walk alongside their baby to help them learn. And the love of a parent is displayed when the child falls, and the parent rescues them or comforts them in their weakness and their incapabilities. So for us, as we make mistakes and come face to face with our weaknesses, we need to remember to trust in God and to remember the truth that when we are weak, God can, at that moment, be our strength. So know that this whole thing is a learning process. To add to that, when feeling insecure, I'd encourage you to meditate on God's grace and the favor that he has towards his children. And this will help you be more comfortable in your growing process, and it will give you confidence that he can make your weaknesses your strengths. Principle number seven, have a loving confrontation. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. In this passage, Jesus is showing how to have a confrontation. He says to go to this person alone first as a way to gain back the friendship. And if they listen to you, you have successfully restored your friendship. And what I want you to notice here is how Jesus tells people to respond to a fault or wrongdoing by confronting the person who wronged you. In my experience, there will be a lot of hurt or pent up feelings if confrontations are avoided or ignored. So we'd be wise to apply Jesus's words here to have a healthy confrontation when people have wronged us so that we can make things right. So if you know that someone did something that was wrong to you and you act out of insecurity and choose not to say anything, there's little to no chance to restore your friendship. I'd say many of our insecurities come from broken relationships. So when a relationship of ours gets hurt due to an offense, we need to do what we can to make the situation better. And we do that by confronting them. But make sure that when you do this, you do so with a heart that loves and desires to reconcile. Because attitude is everything in confrontations. So for you, if something is bothering you for more than a day, 
it's better to say something as soon as you can and not let feelings of bitterness or hostility grow. And if you're really struggling with what to say, try talking to a church leader or someone that you trust so you can get another opinion on how to say things in a loving way. But most of all, focus on your love for that person. Principle number eight, have godly morals. James chapter four, verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. In this passage, James is talking about having conviction and doing the right thing. So note, if we know the right thing to do and are convicted in our hearts to do it, but we don't do it, that would be sin. And the reason why I bring this up is because spirit-led convictions will produce godly morals that we should live by. And godly morals should focus on what God wants us to do, not what people think. So one thing that I wanna mention is that godliness leads to security and comfort, whereas worldliness leads to insecurity and comparison, where we can be tempted to compare ourselves to people when in reality, we should be comparing ourselves to God. So question, when making a decision in your life, do you choose to focus on what God thinks or what others think? Honestly, our world is crazy and there's war, human trafficking and poverty, and we as people can be controlled by our lusts, hatred, and selfishness. So in the midst of all this chaos, one thing that I want you to think about is what God thinks about all this. Like, really look and compare these evil things to what the Bible says about them, and then figure out a way that you can fight these evil things so that they don't enter your life. And this is how we build godly convictions. Another good thing you can do is set healthy boundaries that can help you in your fight against temptation. And you can also get around people who will encourage you to keep these boundaries and not compromise them. And if you need more help in this area, you can watch our video titled, How to Overcome Temptation. So to close this point, as you spend time with God, ask what he thinks and then get his perspective. Because by doing this, God will then have the opportunity to help us think his thoughts, which can lead us to a peace that surpasses our understanding. Principle number nine, make a decision and stick to it. Matthew chapter five, verses 36 to 37. And do not take an oath by your head for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. In this passage, Jesus is warning his followers to be careful when they make oaths or promises. So if we agree to do something, we need to follow through. And if we say no to something, we shouldn't go back and forth on the decision because it confuses people and it's not good. And I'd say a big part of growing as an individual is learning how to say no to things and being aware of what we say yes to. And on that note, be careful because breaking promises can break relationships. And on the flip side, when we honor our promises, stick to our decisions and stay honest, it honors others and it honors God. And it produces character in us. And by continuing to keep our word, we'll also be growing in integrity. James 1.6 says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And what I want you to notice here is that doubting and second guessing decisions creates confusion and instability, which implies that sticking to decisions can build character, trust, and security. So practically speaking, don't make promises you can't keep and learn how to say no to things in a loving way when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed. One way to do this is to say, sorry, I'm not available to help you this time, but please keep me updated. Or you could say, I'd love to help you, but I can't at that time. Could I get back to you when I'm more free? So pro tip, there are nice ways to say no. And bear in mind that saying no in a loving way is something that we have to practice to get better. So that's what to do if you have to say no. So if you are available to say yes to something, stay in good communication with the person and then take ownership of your yes. So make it a point to check in and communicate with them and don't ghost them during the time of what you said yes to. For example, if you agree to hang out with someone and you said that you'll be there, show up at the time you said. But if you can't make it for some reason, make sure to let them know that something came up that you couldn't help. And lastly, as a gentle reminder, don't lie to get out of something you said you would do. And principle number 10, associate with the humble. Romans chapter 12, verses 15 to 17. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. 
Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. In this passage, Paul is describing who to spend time with and how to spend time with them. So when people are celebrating, Paul says to celebrate with them. And when people are having a hard time, Paul says to be empathetic and to grieve with those who are hurting. And after he says this, Paul highlights a bunch of actions that Christians should take. And among those calls to act, Paul says not to be prideful, but to be humble. And there's a reason why Paul says this, because he knows people are largely influenced by the company they keep. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, he says, bad company corrupts good morals. So if you hang out with people that are prideful, you'll have a higher chance of becoming more like them and be prideful. In contrast, if you spend time with the humble, you'll probably become more humble. And I'd argue that when we associate with humble people, whether they're poor in spirit or actually poor, we begin having the right perspective and outlook on ourselves. And it may lead to us seeing that our problems aren't as big as we thought they were. And word of caution, when you spend time with prideful people, you have a far greater likelihood to develop more insecurities. And the reason for this is because pride is a defense mechanism, and people that are full of pride tend to be full of insecurity in comparison too. And while they're constantly trying to display how they're better than others, the reality is that prideful people are trying to prove something. And many times they're pretty hard on themselves once they're alone. And we have to be careful when it comes to this, because we can all be full of pride. And when we have difficulty in humbling ourselves, it is actually a sign of our own insecurity. So something that can help you is find people who are kind, humble, are confident in Christ, are real about their problems, and rejoice about how great God is. Honestly, some of the most humble people I know are content with what they do have, and they're not trying to prove anything to anyone. And something that I tend to see in humble individuals is that they're slow to anger and quick to listen. So some helpful tips as you're identifying if someone is humble is to look to see if a person isn't always talking about themselves and note to see if they're thankful and takes responsibilities for their mistakes and lifts others up. I also find that humble people are good listeners and genuinely care about others' personal growth. But most of all, find someone who shows that they are content with their life and have the joy of the Lord. And be patient when trying to look for someone humble because they may be hard to find, but they are there. And to close, if you're on social media, avoid people that are into themselves and are critical of others all the time. So I'd encourage you to follow people who follow Jesus and show that they are secure in God's love. So if you find yourself feeling insecure, I would highly suggest you consider these 10 principles. Number one, be real and fellowship. Number two, stand up for your faith. Number three, act on what God is telling you. Number four, give to others out of love. Number five, serve others and stretch your ability. Number six, be okay with being weak. Number seven, have a loving confrontation. Number eight, have godly morals. Number nine, make a decision and stick to it. And number 10, associate with the humble. Now I do have to say, insecurity can be a daily battle and is something that we need to fight. And one final thought that I wanna give you is to understand that forgiving past offenses is key to getting over insecurity. You see, the past can really hang some people up and they think of how they were wronged in the past and they end up locking themselves in the cage of their own pent up bitterness. So a healthy habit that I would encourage you to grow in is to regularly ask if you have any bitterness and then find people who will point you to discover your true identity in Jesus. And while this may be difficult for you to do, remember that nothing is too hard for God. And as we lean into him for security, he will provide us comfort and will be the source of our confidence. And as you grow in this confidence, always remember that Jesus loves you.